Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing non-homologous end-joining as a way of uh, repairing um, double-strand breaks within DNA. Okay, so so far what we've discussed is that when you get a double strand break within your DNA, what firstly happens is that these mRN complexes bind uh, to the loose ends of the DNA. Okay, so to the broken uh, double stranded ends of the DNA. Okay, and these mRN complexes consist of three proteins, MRE. Um, 11, which remember stands for meiotic recombination 11, uh, then RAD50, and then MBS1, which remember stands for Nijmegen breakage syndrome 1. Okay, then what happens is this recruits a taxiotelangiectasia mutated dimers to it, okay? And then what follows is uh, autophosphorylation of the taxiotelangiectasia mutated that's actually bound to the MBS1, uh, which then causes it to cleave away from its other taxiotelangiectasia mutated enzyme. And this one that remains bound is now activated. Okay, it's then going to phosphorylate a specific member of the histone 2A uh, family of histone proteins, which is the histone 2AX. And when you phosphorylate histone 2AX, specifically on serine 139, it causes a massive conformational change of this histone 2AX protein, and it's now called gamma histone 2AX. This gamma histone 2AX can bind to a huge number of different proteins, okay, uh, which are going to be recruited to it. Now, one of these uh, proteins that can be recruited to histone 2AX uh, once it's been phosphorylated is the CHK2, which stands for the checkpoint kinase 2. What then is going to happen is the ataxiotelangiectasia mutated enzyme, which is active, is also now going to phosphorylate checkpoint kinase 2, leading to the activation of the checkpoint point kinase 2, which once activated is a serine threonine kinase. Okay, these two now active serine threonine kinases, a taxiotelangiectasia mutated and checkpoint kinase 2, are going to now activate P53. Okay, so to understand this, we need to understand what normally happens to P53. Okay, so P53 has a bit of a sad life normally. Okay it is made, okay? The cell is making P53 continuously. However, the instant the P53 is um, made, it then gets bound to by another protein which is going to snatch the freedom away from P53. Okay, so another protein is going to come and instantly bind to P53. And this is MDM2, okay? So here in green, this is MDM2. Okay, now MDM2 is actually an enzyme and is going to catalyze the addition of ubiquitin groups onto P53. Okay, so uh, just to go back a step, P53 is made all the time within the cell, and then the instant it's made, the MDM2 binds to it. Firstly, this stops the P53 from being able to do anything now. Just the mere binding of MDM2 to it stops it from actually being able to do anything. Okay, but to add insult to injury, the MDM2 is now going to stick ubiquitin groups onto the P53. So this square in vivid purple here, this is not a phosphate group, this is a ubiquitin group, something far more deadly than a phosphate group. Okay, proteins do not want to have ubiquitin groups added onto them, because ubiquitin is the marker that says, destroy me, basically, to a piece of machinery known as the proteasome. Okay, so let me just briefly describe the proteasome to you. So the proteasome is a rather formidable thing in the world of molecular biology. Okay, it is something that if you are a protein, you fear above all else. Okay, it is a tube, effectively. Okay, and proteins go in one end, and fragments of proteins come out the other end. So it is a tube that eats up proteins and breaks them into much smaller fragments. It doesn't quite break them down into amino acids, but it 
splits them up into very small little fragments, okay? And how do you end up going through this horrible tube where you get ubiquitin groups stuck to you? So if you get a ubiquitin group stuck to you, what happens is this binds you to the entrance of the proteasome, and then you will gradually be pulled through. So remember, proteins are a polypeptide, so there are a long polymer of amino acids. The polypeptide will gradually be pulled through the proteasome, and it will gradually be chewed up, basically. Okay, so that's what's going to happen to P53, and it's all because of MDM2. Okay, so usually you do not have P53 doing anything within the cell, because firstly, the moment it's made, it gets uh, bound to by the MDM2, which stops it from doing anything, and then the MDM2 has it broken into smithereens. Okay, right. So, we now want to discuss how are we going to activate P53. Well, we need to stop this horrible process from happening to it. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, this is going to be the work of ataxia telangiectasia mutated here, and also checkpoint kinase 2. So, ataxia telangiectasia mutated, for the third time now, is going to have some fun. It's going to phosphorylate a, a serine residue on MDM2. Okay, so it's going to put this phosphate group on a serine residue on MDM2. Okay, and again, I have this specific serine residue that you're going to phosphorylate. Okay, it is serine 395, okay, that gets phosphorylated. And basically, when you phosphorylate serine 395 on MDM2, it inactivates MDM2. It stops MDM2 from being able to bind to P53. Okay, so P53 is saved, basically, because we are taking out the protein which um, was uh, going to bind to the P53 and inactivate it. In addition, checkpoint kinase 2 is going to do something as well. Okay, it is going to phosphorylate multiple serines within P53. Okay, so we've got our P53 here now, okay. What the checkpoint kinase 2 is going to do is it's going to phosphorylate multiple serines very close to the amino terminus of P53, okay. And these phosphorylations that are produced by checkpoint kinase 2, they protect P53 from the MDM2, which has not been phosphorylated by the ataxia telangiectasia mutated enzyme. Okay, so ATM is good, but it's not reasonably going to be able to take out every single MDM2 molecule. Okay, but checkpoint kinase 2 is going to phosphorylate P53 at certain serine residues, and these phosphorylations will stop P53 from being able to interact with MDM2, or rather, they'll stop MDM2 from being able to bind to the P53. Okay, so they protect the P53 from the MDM2. Okay, so this means that the P53 ends up surviving, and it is now going to act as a transcription factor. So, let me just go through the principle of what a transcription factor is. Okay, so, if we have our double-stranded DNA here, so this is a piece of double-stranded DNA here, then let's say that this box here, this is a gene. Okay, so let's say this is some gene. So I'll colour this in in um, red here. Okay, um, and basically upstream of all genes in the eukaryotic genome, okay, so not just in humans, but in all eukaryotic cells, um, upstream of genes, you have a special region, okay, which I'll colour in purple here, and this region is known as the promoter region, okay, so the promoter region is not actually going to be translated into um, protein, okay, so it's not going to be turned by the ribosome into a sequence of amino acids. However, it is extremely important in controlling the expression level of the downstream gene, i.e. in controlling how much protein you actually produce from that gene, okay? And the reason it's so important for this is because the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme, RNAP2, has to uh, bind to the promoter region in order to actually transcribe the downstream gene. Okay, so let me just recite this uh, series of events to you. So this RNA polymerase 2 enzyme, which is often just abbreviated to RNAP2, uh, this 
has to bind to the promoter region and then at the promoter region it will open up the DNA and then it will work its way along the coding strand of the DNA and produce a piece of mRNA for that gene. Okay, so it's the promoter region that the RNA polymerase 2 binds to basically. Okay, so why does this render the promoter region so important in controlling the expression of the gene? Well, if the promoter region has an extremely high affinity for RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind that all the time. Okay, and therefore the RNA polymerase 2 will work its way along this gene, producing a piece of mRNA that's complementary to the coding strand all of the time. Okay, so you'll produce a large amount of mRNA for this gene, and that mRNA will then be uh, translated into a large amount of protein. Okay, so if you've got a promoter region that has a very high affinity for RNA polymerase 2, that's going to lead to a high expression of that downstream gene. Okay, whereas if the promoter region has an extremely low affinity for binding to RNA polymerase 2, RNA polymerase 2 will hardly ever bind to the promoter region, therefore you'll get hardly any mRNA being produced that is complementary to the coding strand of the gene, okay, and therefore you'll get hardly any protein produced. So promoter regions can control um, the uh, expression level of the downstream gene. Now then, what's a transcription factor? Okay, so uh, this little structure that I'm drawing here, this is going to represent a transcription factor. Okay, so a transcription factor is a molecule which can bind to the promoter region of a huge number of different genes. So generally, transcription factors bind to promoter regions upstream of hundreds of different genes. Okay, and at each of those promoter regions that it binds to, it will change the affinity of that promoter region for binding to RNA polymerase 2. Okay. Now, at some of the promoter regions which it binds to, it will increase the affinity of that promoter region for binding to RNA polymerase 2. And therefore, if you've got an increased affinity for binding to RNA polymerase 2, RNA polymerase 2 will bind there more often. You'll get, therefore, more mRNA being synthesized and, therefore, more protein. Okay, so at some promoter regions, that transcription factor will increase the expression. Okay, so it will enhance the expression of some genes, whilst at other promoter regions, that same transcription factor will actually decrease the affinity of that specific promoter region for RNA polymerase 2. Therefore, RNA polymerase 2 will bind there less, therefore you'll get less mRNA being produced, and therefore you'll get less uh, protein being produced. Okay, so... Um, each transcription factor has a huge plethora of promoter regions it binds to. At some, it will enhance the transcription of the downstream gene. At others, it will repress the transcription of the downstream gene. The overall message is that transcription factors change the expression level of genes. Okay, They increase the expression of some genes, decrease the expression of other genes. Now, p53 is a transcription factor. Now, to actually act as a transcription factor, p53 has to tetramerize. Okay, so four p53 molecules bind together, and this p53 tetramer then binds to the promoter regions and changes the affinity of, of that promoter region for RNA polymerase 2, and therefore um, changes the level of expression of the downstream gene, either upping it or reducing it. Okay, right. So, the response then to DNA damage is to change gene expression. Now, uh, for our purposes, looking at how we're going to repair this double strand break, the important changes in gene expression that p53 is going to produce is that it's going to increase uh, the expression level of the enzymes that are involved in DNA repair, or rather, not necessarily just enzymes, but the proteins involved in DNA repair. So many of the proteins that we're about to discuss when we actually discuss the mechanism of non-homologous uh, end joining, uh, they're going to be upregulated by p53 transcription factors in response to the DNA damage. Okay, so these are DNA repair proteins I should have had there.
Okay, right. So, we'll call it there for this video. That now concludes our discussion of the detection of DNA damage. What we now want to talk about is the actual mechanism of non-homologous end joining. And most of the proteins involved in this are going to have their expressions upregulated by p53 transcription factors.